In my video on the Matrix Explained, I noticed a trend in the comments, and there was a common theme I kept seeing pop up. The Matrix ripped off Sophia Stewart and her story The Third Eye. So I decided to dig into it and see what I could find out. Was the Matrix plot stolen? Stewart's epic story created two of Hollywood's biggest franchises, The Matrix and Terminator movie series and trilogy. See the court documents, letters of access, registered return receipts, FBI evidence, investigation, and future projects. She also links to a website, MatrixTerminator.com. Alright, well, let's check it out too. An interesting aspect of this story, however, is that while I, the writer, Sophia Stewart, sued for copyright theft in the Utah Federal Court and won in 2014, there has been no justice. Well, that's pretty damning. No media attention that announced my win, despite a courtroom full of journalists. Instead, what followed were either smear campaigns against my name, mythologizing me as some fictitious internet hoax, or a mainstream media blackout. So, I did the thing. I bought the third eye so we could go down this rabbit hole together and decide if the Matrix, and the Terminator as she also claims, wrongfully ripped off Sophia Stewart. Alright, I did it. I got through the book. Our story starts with an introduction. Aliens came to Earth and then left promising, and I quote, Watch the heavens. We will be back. And I'm sure at this point, you too spotted it, just like me. I'll be back. Yes, in her case against the Terminator, Sophia Stewart claims that because of her line about aliens incidentally saying we will be back, and Arnold says, I'll be back, that is irrefutable proof that the Terminator was stolen from her. I quote, Mr. Schwarzenegger's line, I'll be back, from the Terminator movie is a direct quote, Sophia Stewart's epic. And yes, there is a typo there, it should be from Sophia Stewart's epic. Proving that the book was the source of the Terminator series! Exclamation mark. I think you can start to see where we're heading with this one. Okay, so aliens came to Earth in the beginning and left. Great. We then learn there's a distant planet where a number of super beings lived, including a godlike being named Mykod, who used the third eye to spread peace and harmony. But an evil super being was born named Morningstar. Morningstar was banished to Earth, but according to a prophecy, would only reign until one day the godlike Mykod would have a child who would defeat Morningstar. And if this is starting to sound a lot like the Bible, with God having Jesus as a child and the fallen angel of Satan, don't worry. Clearly, Sophia Stewart doesn't think she could have possibly ripped off or been influenced by anything, only other things were influenced by her work. Fast forward to a futuristic Earth and the evils of horrible, horrible, evil capitalism have taken over thanks to Morningstar's government. People worship money because money is evil. The secret codename of a number of evil corporations and banks working in a giant conspiracy is the Rothfellers. I'm sure the fact that it sounds just like the Rockefellers is just a super clever and subtle coincidence. A nuclear war destroyed everything except for a computerized city called the Dome. And when I say computerized, I just mean to say that apparently the computers controlled missiles and kept the city safe from germs. Nothing like the computers were in charge or enslaving humans. They're just normal computers doing helpful things. The evil government regime replaced Monopoly and other board games with computer games like Tron, Space Commander, Defender, and Pac-Man because these games would train children to be ready for nuclear war and to be soldiers. That's right, Pac-Man, the game about a yellow pizza eating things, is so evil it's warping our minds to be okay with nuclear war. Also, Tron is a movie, not a game, and any subsequent game that came out based on Tron was just based on a movie. 
Moving on, as we come to the year 2100, a lady named Isius became infatuated with a man and has a one night stand with him. He disappears after that night, but fortunately, as it turns out, this was God. I, I mean, my God. And she has a baby boy she names Jesus, or, or rather, Icon. Icon is hidden away from Morningstar in the desert until he's a teen, at which point he's secretly placed in Morningstar and the evil Rothafeller city. Icon becomes a prominent leader and is set to command a new starship named Space Star. Don't mind my drawing, the ship is the shape of a pyramid with a top that comes off. He has a bunch of visions of an eyeball and learns from the Star Wars Rebel Alliance that the government is evil and they're going to ask him to kill people, and when he receives the command to do so, he uses Jedi powers to trick the evil forces and escapes with the ship deciding Morningstar is evil. He then has a bunch of space missions until arriving at the planet with the third eye. We've reached the title of the book and we're almost at the home stretch. Icon decides he's willing to die for the third eye, and in doing so, reawakens as the chosen one, and saves everybody who are now all naked and proud. The end. So the story has basically absolutely nothing to do with the Matrix or the Terminator, so what legal grounds could she possibly have? And what delusions have led her to think that this story is somehow the basis for those two movies? So. Uh, let's give this a fair shake. Let's go ahead and go over the legal documents that she submitted, and we're going to go through that, talk about it, and see what sort of grounds she thinks she has and what happened in the court cases. In 1981, Sophia Stewart pitches her treatment to 20th Century Fox and Columbia Pictures. Columbia Pictures politely declines, telling her that it isn't commercially viable. In other words, it's bad. In 1985, 20th Century Fox apparently asked for more than just the treatment. So, Sophia Stewart sends this only to hear back that they will only take submissions from people in the Writers Guild. Fast forward to 1999, and she alleges Warner Brothers and The Matrix stole her book. They ask her repeatedly for proof, and say they will definitely look into it once she sends this. In her intro, she acts absolutely flabbergasted that she has to send any kind of proof, and fully believes that because she sent her script to a different movie studio back in the 80s, Warner Brothers has to have seen it and has to have stolen it. After reading her story, Warner Brothers then explains in detail to Sophia Stewart how there's absolutely no infringement and advises she not seek legal action as she will lose the case. In 2001, she messages 20th Century Fox alleging that they stole the Terminator from her because she sent the third eye script to them back in 1981. So here's a brief history lesson. James Cameron based the Terminator on a dream he had of being chased by a robotic assassin from the future. He pitched the script, no one would buy it, until Gail Ann Hurd agreed to produce the film and allow James Cameron to direct. Together, they found Orion as a distributor. So, Sophia Stewart alleges that 20th Century Fox stole the film, and they respond that they didn't produce it, nor do they own it, as much as I'm sure they wish they did. But don't you worry, Sophia Stewart is there to call their bluff. She finds evidence that 20th Century Fox distributed the Terminator in some foreign countries, therefore, she concludes, they lied to her. Even though, you know, they never claimed to not have done some distribution, and that has absolutely nothing to do with the production, creation, or ownership of a film. So, let's take a look at some of the other proof and allegations that she makes. She claims the Wachowskis are comic book writers, and therefore not skilled enough to adapt an epic like her third eye into a film, and therefore use ghostwriters. So, forget about Bone or Berserk, comic book writers, not skilled enough. She also thinks that because there's no source for the script, it had to be stolen, because apparently you can't write a screenplay on its own. So let's get to the actual court case of 2004. <laughs> Sophia Stewart claims that in 1986, she responded to an advertisement by the Wachowskis in a national magazine to take sci-fi manuscripts and turn them into comics. She alleges she sent the third eye and then never heard back from the Wachowskis. Objection! There's no proof of this, so at this point it's just hearsay. In fact, there's no evidence that this advertisement in the magazine by the Wachowskis even exists. At this point in time, one of the Wachowskis had just graduated from high school, and the other one was still in college. <laughs> Sophia Stewart claims that the FBI looked into it in 2001 and found the third eye was copied. Objection! 
Sophia Stewart presents no actual evidence of this. Furthermore, in her book she includes a letter written to her by the FBI in 2008. This letter seems to indicate that she's accusing the FBI of criminal misconduct in 2001. They also tell her how to get access to the information she claims exists, if it indeed does. The defendants, in this case the production companies, try to dismiss the case on the basis of the statute of limitations and latches, which basically states that if the complaint hasn't been issued within three years after the victim knows the copyright offense took place, then it needs to be tossed out. Objection! While the defendants argue that Sophia Stewart had to have heard of 1984's Terminator way before 2004, there's no way to prove this. Hence, a judge dismissed this defense and allowed the case to continue. At this point, I'm going to turn to one of my favorite websites, Snopes, as apparently a newspaper article around this time for the Salt Lake Community College Globe wrongly claims Sophia Stewart won the court case. For reference, the successful counter to dismissal of the court case I just read off to you happened on September 27, 2004. Monday, October 4th, 2004 ended a six-year dispute involving Sophia Stewart et al. Stewart, a New Yorker who has resided in Salt Lake City for the past five years, will recover damages from the films, The Matrix 1, 2, and 3, as well as The Terminator and its sequels. The Globe, once again a community college paper, subsequently corrected their mistake, writing, In reference to the recent article entitled Mother of the Matrix Victorious, some information has been deemed misleading. Miss Sophia Stewart has not yet won her case. The case was dismissed in June 2005 by Judge Margaret Morrow. As discussed earlier, Stewart has proffered no admissible evidence from which a reasonable trier of fact could find that her works were available to any person involved. Defendants have presented uncontroverted evidence that the individuals involved in creating the Terminator films did not have any access to Stewart's literary works. Stewart has likewise adduced no admissible evidence from which a reasonable trier of fact could conclude that her works were available to any person or entity involved in the creation, writing, or production of the Matrix films. Stewart has admitted, moreover, that the Matrix films were the product of independent creation. So the judge ruled pretty harshly against Sophia Stewart regarding the bare minimum standard of if the Matrix and Terminator creators even had access to her work. Regarding if the works were indeed strikingly similar, apparently she forgot to submit the films as evidence. Because Stewart bears the burden of proof on striking similarity, her failure to submit the Terminator and Matrix films in opposition to the motions necessitates the entry of summary judgment against her. Stewart has admitted the Terminator 1 is neither strikingly nor substantially similar to the Third Eye, that Terminator 2 is neither strikingly nor substantially similar to the Third Eye, and that Terminator 3 is neither strikingly nor substantially similar to the Third Eye. As respects the Matrix films, Stewart has admitted that Matrix 1 is neither strikingly nor substantially similar to her treatment and the 47-page manuscript. Rather, she contends that there are substantial similarities between her descriptions of the characters. The only evidence she submits to prove the similarities of her characters to those found in the Matrix films is a single page that contains photographs of nine Matrix 1 characters. But let's talk about these character similarities real quick, as it's also something she brings up in her Third Eye book as irrefutable proof the Matrix ripped her off, because maybe that's how this conspiracy theory has spread. Now, the vast majority of these characters are never mentioned in her actual story. She has a brief character sheet she submitted with basic character attributes. Later in the book, she has an entire section dedicated to character similarities, so let's take a look. If you remember Icon as the Chosen One, she clearly thinks Neo as the one ripped her off there. She thinks Morpheus ripped off a character named Vashta because they're both the older, wise mentor characters. Hmm, never heard of that kind of character before. In fact, ironically, Sophia Stewart states that her story is influenced by Star Wars. So wouldn't Obi-Wan Kenobi be another fit for this character? And Luke Skywalker as the Chosen One? She thinks the character Tank from The Matrix rips off her character Exers, who's described as young and muscular. Another very rare character trait. Cypher, the character who betrays everyone, is a ripoff of the character On, who she states similarly is passive, goes along with things to an extent, and is a betrayer. Uh, funny enough, in the original documents that she includes in this book, she sent in as her treatment and proposal, the character traits for On never list him as a betrayer, so apparently she added that one as further proof. 
Hmm. The city Zion is the same as the dome, because they're both hidden cities. Her spaceship and her story is the same as the ship in the Matrix, because they both use computers. There's rebels in her story, there's rebels in the Matrix. It goes on like that. In reading this, I've developed my own third eye for bullshit. In the intro to the book, she talks about a settlement that was won over the Terminator for $200,000. In the court documents, it's clear she tried to ask for a settlement and was denied. So, all in all, it just comes across as an incredibly skeezy case of someone trying to win money from a successful franchise, or to spend $40 on a book like this, or more, as I think she has more books about it. Um, I'm, I'm just surprised that this conspiracy theory has spread so much, honestly. And it's not over. Sophia Stewart literally filed a certificate of registration for works titled Terminator 5, The Hologram Clones in 2013, and Matrix 4, The Evolution, Cracking the Genetic Code in 2010. Incidentally, the book has absolutely no mention of the final court proceedings and cuts off right after the motion to dismiss was denied. On top of that, she still claims she won the case on her website, which was last updated in 2019, despite my findings and proof I just laid out, which is publicly available online. In her intro, she even spews that because some retailers packaged and sold the Matrix and the Terminator together, you know, as retailers do to try and get rid of inventory and make money, that was clear evidence of a conspiracy against her and that both movies ripped her off. She also thinks Die Hard is a ripoff of Rambo and the movie Speed is a ripoff of Die Hard because they're action movies, I guess? And it's also ironic, because her story is just the Bible mixed with some Star Wars elements, and she doesn't seem to think she ripped anyone off. Anyways, I tried to give this book a fair shake, but there's only one place that it belongs. I hope you like this, and understand that I really did try to go into this with an open mind and actually look at the evidence. On a brighter note, maybe you'll enjoy our videos on The Matrix Explained and the history of the Terminator. Keep it tuned to GSU and... Try not to spread conspiracy theories. Later.